so effectiveness still includes the effectiveness of uh, advertising spend and the rest of the budget, but we also need to understand and evaluate and increase marketing's wider contribution to business performance through its role in helping customers become more customer focused. Because it's customers' overall experience of the brand and the company that drives um, consumer behavior and therefore short-term performance and also brand equity and therefore long-term performance. So what do we know about this? We've known for some time that the marketing concept does work. Companies do succeed by profitably, key word, meeting customers' needs better than the competition. We also know that CEOs and other top executives do understand the value of brand equity. And we know that because other things being equal, they're willing to be paid less if the firm has strong brands. And that's because they identify with the company and working on a strong brand is good for your reputation and future career prospects. Finally, based on research published only last year, we now know that having a CMO in the top team and an influential marketing department does help companies become more customer focused and leads to better short and long-term business performance. CEOs rightly want companies to be more customer focused. Marketers are the linchpin for making this happen. In principle, their role should be exalted. Top management should respect them and look to them as it makes all the big business decisions. Unfortunately, things don't always work that way. In reality, many marketers have limited business impact and career success. In other words, marketing, in the broad sense of driving customer focus, is important, but marketers often aren't. That's why former McKinsey partner Thomas Barter and I wanted to find out how marketers can increase their influence and have more successful careers. And that is the book. It came out only last month, just published by McGraw-Hill. Now, the research details are in the book, but in summary, we looked at extensive self-assessments from over 1,200 marketing leaders from around the world and at 360 degree data on another 7,400 marketing and non-marketing leaders, a total of over 68,000 individual assessments. So it's not just what marketing leaders said about their own behavior, impact, and success. It's also about what their bosses, peers, and subordinates said, and how this compares with the equivalent 360 data on other leaders in finance, operations, and so on. We think there are three reasons why marketers are not naturally influential in companies. Every marketer faces three big gaps. Gap number one is a trust gap. Think about the work you've done in the last week. How much of that was about the future? Future sales, future campaigns, future products. 50%, 70%, maybe 100%. Marketing is mostly about the future. And what do you think when someone comes to you and says, I can tell you what will happen in the future? You're skeptical. That's why when you as a marketer stand next to someone from finance or operations, much of what you say will always sound less reliable because it is. <laughs> as a marketer, you'll always face that trust gap. Gap number two is a power gap. Imagine your company has the best customer experience in the market, the best products, the best distribution, the best service support, the best value for money. How many people in your company will be involved in creating this market-leading customer experience? Many. In fact, directly or indirectly, almost everyone in the company. And how many of these people report to marketing? Few. Most of the people you need to create a great customer experience don't report to marketing. If they want to, they can pretty much ignore you. You have to earn their support. Gap number three is a skills gap. There was a time when, as an experienced marketer, you were the expert. 
your team could look to you for detailed advice on what they were doing. The reality today is that no one can be an expert on every aspect of marketing. There's just too much and it's changing too fast. And half of what the 23-year-olds are doing didn't even exist when you were 23. You simply can't know it all. These three gaps explain why marketers aren't naturally influential and important. But despite these gaps, quite a few marketers in our study did really well with high business impact and great careers. Why? Was it their gender? No. B2B versus B2C? No. Personality? No, or only at the margin. Interestingly, based on our research, most competent marketers have it within themselves to become great marketing leaders. Was it their functional skills? Of course they matter, but less than you might think. Their bosses or their companies, they play a significant role, but the real answer is leadership skills. The most successful weren't just good at doing marketing, they also excelled at leading marketing. They found ways to bridge the three gaps. Instead of accepting their fate, they managed to become influential by mobilizing their bosses, their colleagues, their teams, and themselves. They made marketing important. So what did these effective and successful marketers do that you and your team could do too? We talk about 12 powers in the book. Here are some of the most important ones. Some of them may be things you're already doing, but we now have real evidence on what works and on which are the most important leadership behaviors driving marketers' business impact and career success. <coughs> Tip number one, close the trust gap and mobilize your boss. To be relevant to your boss, the issues you tackle must be big. That means meeting both sets of needs, the customers and the companies. In the left circle are your customers' top needs. In the right circle are your CEO's top needs. The overlap between them is what we call the value creation zone, or V-zone for short. What happens when people work outside the V-zone? As an Apple employee in the early 80s, Steve Jobs created his own team to work on his pet project, the Macintosh. They had their own building with a pirate flag on top. Jobs said it's better to be a pirate than in the Navy. Because he was a perfectionist, there were huge cost and time overruns. Meanwhile, Apple was hemorrhaging cash. Jobs was brilliant at understanding and meeting customers' needs, but he hardly cared about the company's cash needs or what his CEO thought. He only focused on the left-hand circle. Jobs worked outside the V-zone. He almost bankrupted the business and the CEO fired him. Of course, if you focus only on the right-hand circle and don't meet customers' needs, that's the other road to ruin. So, if you only look at what your customers want, you won't get much attention or support at the top and you may get fired. And if you only look at what your boss wants, you may create useless products and you may also get fired. So how about you? What are the top three customer needs you're tackling? And how are you also meeting the CEO's top three needs? Are you and your team working in the V-zone? There are other things you can do to mobilize your boss, like delivering demonstrable returns, which is the core marketing effectiveness agenda this week, and working with the best external partners. Together, these three factors explain 23% of the variation in our senior marketers' business impact and 15% of the variation in their career success as a proportion of the total variation explained by all 12 powers in combination. Tip number two, bridge the power gap and mobilize your colleagues by walking the halls. Your non-marketing colleagues have their own busy, busy agendas. So when you come and tell them, hey, we need to launch this new product, offer this new service, and change the way you work, as you leave the room, some of them will hope you get run over by a bus. You can't mobilize your colleagues if they don't listen to you. But you can tell them a story that gets under their skin. 
and captures their hearts. Your story can be really simple. When Ford was close to collapse, CMO Jim Farley gave people hope by telling them, for generations of drivers, the blue Ford logo stood for pride and personal adventure. Let's bring back our customers' pride and sense of adventure. To convince your non-marketing colleagues, walk the halls and work with them. That's what Steve Walker, product manager at Sony Ericsson, did to create one of the company's biggest successes. In the late 90s, when phone sales were slowing down, Steve had an idea. People love to listen to music. Why not put music on our phones? We own the Walkman brand. Why not create a Walkman phone? Colleagues thought he was mad. The development team said, it's hard to integrate good synthesizers in a phone. The software team said they had no capacity for the project. Legal said they wouldn't be able to license music rights at an affordable price. But instead of arguing, Steve surprised his colleagues. He walked the halls, listened to all their concerns, and offered to work through the issues with them. And as he did this, many of those issues disappeared. After many such discussions, the Walkman phone launched in 2005 and was an instant hit. At its peak, it stood for 25% of Sony Ericsson's global revenue. OK, it was only a short-term success because in 2007, Apple launched the iPhone and flattened everyone in the market. But by then, Steve had created a lot of value for the company by walking the halls, listening to his colleagues, and turning his dream of a Walkman phone into a reality. The most successful marketers in our study bridged the power gap and made marketing relevant to their non-marketing colleagues by hitting the head and the heart with a compelling story, walking the halls and going first, that is, acting as a role model and leading from the front. These together accounted for 22% of the explicable variation in their business impact and a massive 32% of the explicable variation in their career success. Tip number three, bridge the skills gap by becoming a leader of leaders and mobilizing your team. Marketing skill needs are exploding. Most marketing conferences, books, articles, and blogs are full of the latest digital techniques, challenges, and opportunities. If your ambition is to learn all these new skills, forget it. It can't be done. This is the century of marketing leaders. Leading marketing isn't the same as doing marketing. It's even more important. Your role is to build a team with the best mix of skills for your particular market, brand, and strategy, and then help them to be brilliant. Napoleon did this. He was a great recruiter of talent, and he had to delegate a lot to his generals. <clears throat> so it's about two steps. Step one, <clears throat> think about the V-zone and ask yourself, what are the two to three distinctive skills that will enable us to make the biggest difference in our market? Is it pricing analytics, creative advertising, consumer insight, or sales support? Of course, everyone in the team will also need basic marketing skills and the right values and be good enough communicators and team players. But on top of that, which specific technical creative and leadership skills do you need in your team to be the best in your market? Step two, teach your team to ask for forgiveness, not permission. Suppose you hire a young campaign manager and tell her, before a campaign goes live, I want to approve it. What will happen? If the campaign goes well, she'll tell people about it and celebrate, but less than if it had been entirely her own responsibility. And if it fails, she won't care that much because you said it was OK. What if, instead, you tell her, I don't need to see your campaign before it goes out, but let's look at your results together once a month so we can learn? What's going to happen now? When she succeeds, you'll praise her and celebrate with her. But when she fails and you help her understand why, she'll learn, keep improving, and be more willing to take calculated risks in the future. The most successful senior marketers in our study were leaders of leaders. That means getting the skills mix right, covering people in trust, 
and letting the outcomes speak. Together, these powers explain 30% of the explicable variation in their business impact and 19% of the variation in their career success. Does your team ask for permission or for forgiveness? Tip number four, know how you inspire. As a marketer, inspiration is your biggest weapon. You can't tell your boss what to do. You can't tell your colleagues what to do. These days, you can't even tell your team what to do if you want to keep the best people. But you can inspire people to follow you, provided you yourself are inspired first. Inspiration as a marketer can come from many sources. Some are inspired by knowing their stuff about customers or products, some by beating the competition, some by peer recognition, some by having a big dream. Whatever it is to follow you, people need to see the flicker of inspiration in your eyes. Mobilizing yourself by knowing your stuff, knowing how you inspire, and aiming high, together explain 25% of the explicable variation in our senior marketer's business success, and as much as 34% of the explicable variation in their career success. To conclude, I'm delighted that this week we're setting our sights so high. Addressing this broader agenda won't be easy, but we have several good things to build on. Obviously, we have the IPA Effectiveness Awards going back to 1980, plus a growing body of other material on the effectiveness of advertising and other marketing activities. For instance, the Social Works collaboration between the IPA, the Marketing Society, and the MRS is looking at the effectiveness of social media, not only for advertising, but also for customer insight and CRM. We also have a growing body of relevant research knowledge. We know that marketing, the marketing concept works, that CEOs and CFOs do understand the value of strong brands, and that having a CMO in the top team and an influential marketing team do help companies focus on their customers and beat their competitors. Finally, although many marketers do have limited business impact and career success, we also now know how to improve that for the benefit of customers, companies, and the marketers themselves. All that seems to me a pretty good foundation for the work we have to do on marketing's wider effectiveness beyond the marketing budget. Thank you. Again, I'm, I'm going to encourage our audience to ask some questions. Um, before they do, let me, let me pose a couple. Thank you very much. Fascinating discussion, as I, as I expected. Um, just curious in terms of those 12 steps you outlined yes. uh, based on your research, yes. um, and not just this study, but longer term. You've been looking at this for a long time. Yeah. How do companies respond when you explain these steps? To them. How, well, and how this prepared is, are they to jump into this? This is, this is, this is new new. I mean, so the, the, this is, I think, the third presentation I've given on this. So the, the uh, you know, one in Milan, um, one at London Business School, and, and this is the third. So for me, it's very early days. My co-author, Thomas, uh, specializes in marketing leadership. So he's sort of talking about it all the time. But um, what I've done is focus on the research and then turning that into a book. Um, uh, the reactions I'm getting tend to be uh, a kind of relief. Hmm. Uh, so one person said it was therapeutic um, <laughs> because uh, it's clearly relating to the frustrations which many marketers have. Yeah. Um, and uh, this is a very activist book. Okay? This is saying, A, ethical marketing is a good thing. Right? It is actually making the world a better place. And B there are things we can do about the situation. So as always, I mean, as with, with sort of problem definition in the brief, you know, with advertising, you know, start off understanding the problem. Where are we now? Why are we here? And so on. So I think the fact that we're talking about those three gaps, and those three gaps are nobody's fault. It is inherent in marketing that you're going to struggle to have influence particularly compared to finance, but compared to a lot of other disciplines as well because of these three gaps. And I think people are sort of relieved to hear about that. Having said that, the answer is not then to slash your risks. The answer is, the risk is it's, you know, 
there are concrete things you can do about it. So I hope it's very empowering. And the initial reactions, I have to say, have been very positive of people saying, yes, you are describing my world, and thank you. I need to work on some of these things. And um, so if you do read the book and you do you know, the free self-assessment test on the website, then decide which of the 12 powers, you know, which are the three you need to work on most as a leader. And they will be some combination of the ones that are most important in the stats and the ones where your self-assessment says, maybe I'm not as good at this as I should be. I'm going to throw it to questions because I'd love to hear from some people in the audience. Uh, there's a mic coming, a gentleman there. If you could let us know your name and the organization you're from, we'd be very grateful. Of course. So uh, Colin Wheel, I'm here representing uh, AMEC, uh, which is an association for the measurement and evaluation of communications. Yes. Uh, my question is, um, the, when you were undertaking the research, what surprised you most about the findings in terms of what was making marketing leadership more effective? Well, I think actually the, the small contribution of personality um, to, to the outcomes, uh, particularly business impact, it has slightly more effect on, on um, career success, as, as you'd expect. But uh, that to us was actually very, you know, you can't blame your parents, right? You can blame the inherent situation of marketing and, and these three gaps which you have to overcome. But, you know, I would have expected personality to be a bigger explanatory factor. May I ask a follow-up then? Sure. Um, so we, you talk about the gap in terms of marketing actually doesn't control a lot of the customer experience yes. that is actually delivered. Yes. Uh, have, did you encounter anybody within the marketing guys who said, well, it's actually not my fault, I've done all I can do, and it's up to the other guys to do their job? I haven't sort of come across that. I mean, I think nothing we're saying, I hope, makes this look easy or trivial. No, not okay. This is, this is difficult stuff. Mm. And, I mean, I was very interested by some of the, you know, the first panel saying, um, obviously, we've got a sort of narrow agenda to do with return on advertising and all of that. We have a lot of knowledge about it. We know, we know it's, it's, it's harder to demonstrate, uh, you know, if the budget isn't that big, if it's not a campaign, but it's long term, if it's about the brand rather than short term, so all of those things. Um, but, you know, we sort of know where we stand on that. And because of the IPA effectiveness awards, we are world leading in that area. Uh, as, as the opening presentation said, since 2002, the aim has been to make these marketing effectiveness awards, meaning spending the budget. Once you get beyond that, um, I don't find any marketers who disagree with this, you know, argument that marketing leaders and their teams should work hard to get outside the marketing silo, understand the business, understand the business's needs, but particularly understand the perspectives of their non-marketing colleagues who are not idiots, and then work collaboratively with them. So uh, the only pushback one gets is, you know, it's difficult. And I guess I would say that ultimately, customer focus is a leadership issue at the top of the organization. So although we found that these leadership behaviors were more important than the organizational context, if the CEO really doesn't get it, start looking for another job, okay? Because you just, it just can't be done because it will always be short-termist and, and so on. But you. You, you know, your working assumption is if you, if you have a clear, a clear process for, you know, which supports and you have evidence that supports what you're arguing, then CEOs, CFOs do know that some things can't be quantified, that it is a question of judgment, and take them through your thinking. They will be receptive, which is why I was so struck by this, and this is published in one of the, you know, the top four academic journals, this, this result, that, and two of the authors are my colleagues at London Business School, that CEOs are paid less, other things being equal, if the company has strong brands. So don't tell me they don't understand the value of brands. Okay? Increasingly, business is brand-centric. And as long as you're using the language of business and maybe the language of customers, not marketing speak, they will get it. Brilliant. Um, I think I have time for one more question. Uh, gentleman at the front. 
Again, let us know who you are and where you're from. Uh, John Kieran from Brain Juicer. Hello, Paddy. Thanks Hello. for that. Hi. Um, the return on investment, the trust piece at yes. the beginning, feels to me like the critical one. I mean, I, uh, yeah. And it strikes me that here we are at the IPA, you know, done this effectiveness awards. But as far as I've experienced, almost no company I've met does an IPA effectiveness type job on every brand every mm. year. And it's a bit like drug trials, only yes. publishing the ones that work. Yes. Yes. And it's great that we see the ones that work, but surely that has to just be a, a kind of a basic requirement on everything. So you admit the failures as well as the successes. And I don't know what, what no. your... Well, I agree with that, but also because, I mean, a theme this week is the concept of an effectiveness culture. And that effectiveness culture is not just the effectiveness culture within the marketing team. It is effectiveness culture across the organization. So a lot of this is to do with soft relationships. If you do spend time with particularly your finance colleagues, okay, they understand what's difficult about this. And that means that you create a culture in which you can talk about your failure. We learn more from failure than from success in life you know, and in business. So the first step, you know, there's a technical dimension because let's say, I mean, everyone says short, m m measuring the impact of a short-term promotion is easy. Well, it's fairly easy because you have to have a good model of the counterfactual. And that counterfactual is what would have happened during the period of the promotion if you hadn't done the promotion and what would have happened after the period of promotion because of purchase acceleration and so on. So, you know, you actually need a rather good model of purchases in order to, to look at the increment and you need a good relationship with the accountants and the operations people to know what's the true incremental cost. Okay, so what's the impact on the bottom line? So that should be the easiest task because it's about the short term and we've got numbers. But because most organizations suffer from too much fear of failure, okay, of, of people feeling they have to ask for permission, okay, not, not you know, apologizing, you know, forgiveness afterwards, we have not created in most organizations a situation where you routinely do the post-mortem and you do it straight and you share it and then you look for the lessons coming out of that. I mean, one of the dirty secrets in every organization, including all yours, is everybody lies a bit to their boss and hides bad news and spins good news and the boss invariably underestimates the extent to which that happens despite doing exactly the same to the boss's boss. So, you know, if you haven't got good metrics and that kind of discipline, okay, you haven't got a proper learning organization. So I, I, we're in violent agreement about that. <laughs> On which note, uh, it, 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 it's up to me to join uh, the, the audience in, in thanking you for a great Pleasure. talk. Thank you, Patty. Mm -hmm. Good. Mm -hmm.